Let's pray together. We'll get started for our Tuesday night study, and then we'll do a bit of introduction and a few other things. Father God, thank you that you brought us here this evening. It is good to be here in this place that we can meet together, we can pray together, and we can fellowship with one another. We might encourage one another, that we might hear truth from your word. We might be equipped to deal with the things in life that come, act, well, that come to us, that come against us, that you send to us. All of it for our good is what your word tells us. But in many things, and at many times, what we experience in a particular moment doesn't feel like it's good. This life is fraught with a lot of sorrow that exists in this world because of sin. Even though we, your people, who are saved by your grace, are tremendously blessed, still being in this world, we do deal with sorrow ourselves. And your word is not silent. It tells us how to deal with these things and gives us great hope as we do so. I pray this evening that we would truly hope in you, as your word tells us we must, and that we would grow to be all the more the family of God, having heard this. Not that we weren't already, but that our desire would be to minister to one another in times of grief and sorrow. Encourage because of what your word tells us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I imagine up until possibly a few hours ago, you may have been prepared to come here this evening and hear a biblical theological exposition of part of the Baptist Catechism or the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. But I'm not doing that. I'm going to leave that to Brandon. He is more than capable of doing so, and I'm sure that's part of his lesson plan. And given that some circumstances that have come up Brandon and I chatted a bit, and we talked about a, what subject would be good for this evening. And he mentioned the subject of grief. And I thought that was an excellent idea. Not because it's a very happy subject. By definition, it's not. <laughs> and it's not something that is popular at all. Certainly not in this society. Generally speaking, people in the United States, probably the West in general, but certainly in the United States, don't like to talk about grief because we don't like to talk about the issue of death. But the scriptures are not silent about this, not in the least. And I think it is to our detriment, very much so, that we have failed to address this topic more than we do, not just from a pulpit, but in conversation with one another. So we're going to be discussing that, and I'm going to highlight a particular book. It's a very short book, one that I skimmed back through over the last couple of days in preparation for this lesson this evening. It's one of only a handful of books that I have read more than twice in my life. It's a book by James White. It's extremely short. You could read it in an evening. Well, Grieving Our Path Back to Peace. And it is something that he wrote, I think back in 1990s, one that they handed out in great quantities after 9-11 took place. To point people to Christ in their time of grief was such a great loss that it happened. So I'm going to start by reading through a small excerpt from this book, give some personal examples, go into the Word of God, because in it we truly do have truth, we have understanding, we have help for dealing with times of grief, which we all will experience. Uh, to some degree, we've already experienced it, everyone in this room, I'm sure. And the more gray you get in your hair, the more you're going to experience it. It's a fact of life. Death is around us. And there's a temptation, I know, I certainly felt it when I was younger, when I was in my teens, even in my 20s. Generally speaking, with a few exceptions, one of which I'll talk about this evening, you're young and you're living your life and you have a great portion of your life in front of you. Why be thinking about issues of sorrow, of grief, of death? Well, some of the scriptures we'll address this evening will talk about that. But first, I'm going to read just a short excerpt here. He starts off the book this way. 
He says, when I picked up the phone, I thought my friend Mike was calling about my computer. He had kept me sane during the preceding weeks when I was going through upgrade trauma, and I thought he was calling about the next item we needed to replace. I was wrong. Jim, he said, his voice strangely thin. I lost my granddaughter last night. She's gone. Ministers and those who have worked as hospital chaplains have the strange belief that they are supposed to have immediate answers in such situations. We think we are supposed to be superhuman or something and always prepared for such an announcement. I proved my humanity by responding with nothing more than, what? Mike went on to tell me more about what had happened. His granddaughter, Autumn Dawn, had been born four weeks and one day earlier. I remembered his joy and pride at his first grandchild. But now she was gone, and as Mike said, last night I just wanted to die. I've lived 47 years in this world and made a mess of things. Why couldn't God take me and leave her? I had gathered enough of my wits about me to realize that now was not the time for in-depth theological analysis of the transcendent reasons behind this tragedy. There would be time enough for that another day. For now, I simply wanted to be there for my friends, so I asked if there was anything I could do. The viewing was Friday night. I've done my share of funerals, having worked as a hospital chaplain, so I'm not a stranger to death. But there is simply something wrong with seeing a 29-day-old baby girl in a funeral chapel. My mind did not want to accept the reality before me. I held Mike and we cried together. Funeral was the next morning. The congregation of Mike's church was there for him. His pastor did a masterful job. I don't believe I could have made it through such an experience. I simply can't control my tears well enough. They took the tiny cradle out of the church and whisked it away in a hearse. Words failed me. That night I made up a card for Mike. I inserted some pictures I had obtained of Autumn from a memorial Mike put on the internet for her. Accompanied by my seven-year-old daughter, Summer Marie. You know how old Summer is, now you know how long ago this was. I went over to Mike's house to deliver the card. After spending some time in the house, we went outside. As I was getting ready to leave, I gave Mike a hug. There was a moment of silence. And then Summer threw her arms open wide and said, My turn! As Mike knelt down to receive from Summer the greatest gift she could give him. I thought about how wonderful it is that God puts others into our lives. And so begins a process in Mike's life. The viewing and the funeral, just the beginning. The process of grieving has now begun. It will not be an orderly process. It will oftentimes call him into the darkest alleys of emotional pain, and at times propel him into confusion, sadness, and even once in a while, joy. But it is a process that he will go through for two simple reasons. He's human, and he's loved. And he loved, I should say. Since he is human, he will grieve, for God designed us that way. And since he opened his heart and loved his granddaughter, Autumn Dawn, he will grieve the loss of that special little girl. Anyone who is old enough to love is old enough to grieve. Fight as we might against it. That is the way God made us. My friend Mike enters into grief as a Christian. There is no promise in Scripture that says the believer will be spared these kinds of tragedies, none at all. The promise is that God will be with those who mourn, not that he will keep them from such things. But what will it mean to Mike that he goes into this process believing that Jesus Christ died and rose again? How will this impact his grief? Sadly, some Christians think they should not grieve. My loved one's in a better place, so why should I grieve? Yes. Your loved one may well be in a better place, but you've been lost an important part of your life. 
and that causes mourning and grief. We miss that person and the love we shared. Being a Christian does not remove your human feelings from you. You will grieve that loss just like every other human being. That was the first few pages of that book that I mentioned to you. Much of what I'm going to say this evening is loosely taken from parts of this book. But I also wanted to give a four of my own personal examples. I've got a little gray hair, I've had a few. And they're examples of different intensity as far as the grief that I experienced. Partly because of the distance of a relationship, some farther away, both literally, literally farther away and also with regard to relationship, some much closer. And the closer you are to a person in a relationship, the more time that you've spent, the more affection that you have, the more of your life that you've invested in a person, the more intense grieving can be. Twenty twenty was a difficult year for all of us. In November of twenty twenty, my last grandparent passed away, my grandmother, who was in her eighties. Because of all the restrictions and things that were still in effect, but in the, even in that month of November, we were not able to go up to the funeral. So that grieved me. Not only that I didn't get to see my grandmother before she died, but that I wasn't able to be at her funeral. As I said, she was the last one. I have no more living grandparents. Many good memories, and we should be thankful for them. Tis one example. Another example earlier that year, before all the madness of COVID started, my stepfather passed away after approximately a two long, two year long battle with lung cancer. He'd been married to my mother for many, many years, over 25. And though we often hear terrible horror stories about how step-parents can be, this was not the case with Jeff. He did an excellent job serving as our father in the stead of my father. He never referred to my brother and I as my mother's kids. We were his kids. And it was a time of sorrow. Things I still sometimes shed a tear about when I look back on. This was something that was said, a different situation, something that was said when I was in the ordination council, getting several questions asked of me, the area of practical theology. On Friday evening, I brought this up. All of you in here have met, well, five of my children. Well, five of them. If you have figured out the ages of our kids, Rose is 20. Brooke wasn't feeling very good. She's not here. She's 18. Benjamin turned 16 on Saturday. Happy birthday, Ben. Joshua will be 12 next month. Josiah just turned 10. Notice something missing? 20, 18, 16, 12, 10. Where's 14? Yeah, he'd be 14. Helene's been pregnant six times, not five. Two months after Helene and I were married. This will be the last example. I can still count to four. But two months after Helene and I were married, I had just returned back. It was February. Just returned back from a, what was called a ministerial education day with Southwest Baptist University. People who were in the pastoral ministries program would frequently be volunteer to go preach at a local church and several churches in the area which was a very wide area, very rural in that particular section of the state, but we would go and we would fill the pulpit and they would grade us on content and delivery and that sort of thing as part of an analysis and helps for us to be able to get our ministerial degrees. And I just got back from one of those after Sunday and Helene and I were talking and I was excited having come back and then the phone rang. 
On the phone was her father, with her mother screaming in the background. And he simply said, nope, John blew his brains out. John was my wife's brother. That one was tough. And I say was tough, but the fact of the matter is every single one of those things that I mentioned is still part of my life. There are things I think about from time to time, things about which I still shed tears, and there's no sin in that. They are things that God has used to develop me and everyone else who is involved. And I'll be saying many things with regard to grief elements of the process, what healthy grief looks like, grieving process, what an unhealthy process looks like. So, but before I talk about those things specifically this evening, I want to read to you a few texts of Scripture and talk about them for a minute. Because in the Word of God, do we have the right perspective of how to deal with the things of this life? We love to talk about beautiful, heady doctrines. Oh, I love to talk about that. There was a lot of good discussion and diving deep into the text of the Word of God on Saturday evening at my house around the table. I enjoyed just sitting back and listening. Sometimes the voices were raised a bit, not in anger, but because there, there was a passion for the truth of the text. It's like, though no, we go carefully, we look at it, examine it closely, because we know what God has said is true, and that is what we must believe. Absolutely, yes. But there's a danger, and I think that's especially true, with how did Darian put it, a church full of nerds, and we kind of are that in many ways, to focus very heavily on the head knowledge of the Scriptures, and sometimes inadvertently neglect the fact that the Word of God is meant to guide us in our everyday lives with real earthy experiences. And it is. And for the issue of grief, there are four texts, three of which we'll deal with now, one near the end. First, first, the th first Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. That's where I'm going first. First Thessalonians, I can't even say it tonight. First Thessalonians, a little, little after is probably good as a bit of comic, a little relief of well, such a heavy topic, so that's fine. But First Thessalonians, there I said it, chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Paul writes, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. We all know what it means when he says asleep. That's simply a euphemism for death. So he's saying, we, don't want you, we do not want you to be uninformed, rather, about those who have died. So that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. As I was reading in that account that James White gave in the introduction to his book, it was said, talking about the fact that when someone dies who is in Christ, they're in a better place. And that is true. We still grieve, though. It follows from this, by the way, with the instruction that Paul gives here and elsewhere, grieving is normal. Paul does not say that you will not grieve. He says... I tell you these things so that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. The implication is you will grieve. And if we somehow think that we shouldn't be, we are very wrong. By the way, the emotions that are associated with it are normal too. The pain, the sorrow, sometimes even guilt and anger, confusion. These are things that are common to man. And they are part of a grieving process. You are not strange for feeling it, and perhaps even better said, more importantly said, you're not alone in feeling it. You're definitely not going out of your mind, by the way, not at all. Grieving and what comes with it is normal, 
when, not if, but when we weep at a loss and are mourning, we can be confident we're responding the way God designed us to respond to such a loss. But beyond that, as I said, Paul doesn't say that we're not going to grieve. He says, we will, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. That is the precious jewel for the Christian as he or she grieves. That word hope. Now, we need a little explanation for that word hope. When Paul says hope, he does not mean what people in the United States say when they say they hope for something. When we typically use the word hope, we're, it's an example of wishful thinking. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow because I'd like to mow my lawn. I hope I get a good review at work in this upcoming review session because I'd really like to get a raise. I hope the Major League Baseball Association can get everything worked out so that there's a baseball season this year. Or any number of things. That's an example of what? Wishful thinking. Something we'd like to have happen, but we have no certainty that it will. That's not biblical hope. When Paul says that we have hope, he illustrates what he means by that in the next sentence. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Not maybe. Not, oh, there's a good possibility that we will be with them in eternity, or that we'll have our tears wiped away, or that some good will come out of this. Nothing like that at all. This is a guaranteed surety. This will take place. We have this hope, and it does not disappoint, as Paul says in Romans 5. Why? because it is given by the promise of God himself. It is a certainty, a confidence. If you take it to the bank, it's genuine. No wishful thinking here. That's why, that when we grieve, we don't grieve as the world does. They do not have this hope, we do. And it is a promise from God himself. A text that Brandon referenced briefly on Sunday afternoon, from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. We should ask the question, what is available to us that is not available to the world? The text gives us a beautiful answer. We have the comfort of God himself that comforts us in all our afflictions. Not a few. Not just the big ones that we perceive as big or small or whatever. We are comforted by God. It's that hope thing again, isn't it? Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. They shall be comforted. Not only should we expect to mourn, but we ought to do so. But there's something else in this, not just with Matthew 5, 4, but in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Did you notice, or 3 through 5, sorry. Did you notice that it said that the comfort that we get from God, what are we supposed to do with that? There's a purpose statement there, isn't there? God of all comfort, who comforts us, comforts us in our affliction. Yes, God comforts us in our affliction. Not maybe, he does. We can have confidence as we hope in him that we'll receive such comfort. But what are we supposed to do once we have been comforted, that comfort we've received? We don't just keep it all to ourselves. No. So that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And God has comforted us, and he has brought us through struggles, trials, all sorts of grievings. And we have brothers and sisters, in our church especially, who are in great sorrow because of loss. We can help comfort them. In fact, that's part of the purpose, isn't it? 
that God has comforted us because we can comfort each other. Mourning is not something we're supposed to go through by ourselves. It's something to be done in community with the fellowship of Christ in his church. That must be an application of this text. Part of the purpose for God's comfort on us is that we might be able to comfort others. Grief is not meant to be handled alone. But it is our tendency to think we can handle it alone. Because we don't want to bother somebody else. One reason. Because they wouldn't understand. Not entirely, but it's not an excuse. But we're meant to pour our lives into one another. In this situation and in others. Certainly here. We need rebuke of our tendency to think we can handle it alone. We simply cannot no matter how tough you think you may be. If you're not strong enough, you weren't meant to be. But our God is strong enough, and through the means that he has established, that strength is also present. In this case, the people of God together. As I mentioned before, this is not a popular teaching in our society, the teaching on death itself, the fact that we do die. We don't like talking about death. We don't like dealing with the fact of our own mortality. But by the way, 10 out of 10 die, unless your name is Elijah or Enoch. Right? None of those in here, you're going to die. Well, Jesus died too. I mean, he, well, there's the resurrection and all that, but yes. But he still died. You're going to die. Yeah, Lazarus died twice. What a bum deal. But in any case... You will. All of us will. And this is something that was much better understood in previous eras. Long before modern medicine, most of the modern medicine that we take for granted, like being able to go to your medicine cabinet and get a couple of ibuprofen for a headache, that didn't exist 100 years ago. I mean, they had some crude aspirin, I think, back as far as part of the Civil War. But prior to that, there wasn't anything. Pain relievers? What? Antibiotics, they started with penicillin and bread mold. We have all kinds of things these days. And it's something that I'm reminded of from time to time back in the Reformation era. They understood grief in those days. With the bubonic plague, literally half of Europe died. In those days, a married couple, the wife, the mother, would have, probably have to give birth to about 10 children to have one of them survive to adulthood. They understood grief, they understood death much better than we. But the reality is, even in an era of medicine and rare things like uh, childhood mortality, we will face death, that of ourselves and that of others. It will happen. So we need to be able to deal with it. And when it happens, all kinds of questions come up, such as the question, how long am I going to grieve? How long is this going to last? Because it's not really an enjoyable experience, I assure you. Well, part of the answer to the question, how long are you going to grieve, is, the, is this. You never get over it completely. You become functional again. And you grow through it. But with the examples that I gave at the beginning of this talk, I still shed a tear for them from time to time. For our, our son, that, yes, our son, that was lost in a miscarriage, be 14 now, I still shed a tear over him from time to time. There are a great many more shed in the, on the original experience, but it still happens, and that's okay. Because it's been said that time heals all wounds, and as long as you grieve properly, that is a true statement. But scars do get left behind. And you still notice them every now and then. Another quote from the book, it says, you may well shed a tear 20 years from now on an anniversary or a birthday, and there isn't anything wrong with that. 
One does not seek to escape grief. Remember that. One does not seek to escape grief, but to embrace it, work through it, allow it to heal the hurt, so that we can move on with our lives in full light and recognition of what has happened and how God changed our lives as a result. This doesn't really answer the question that I posed earlier. Well, how long then? How much time is this going to take? Well, it varies. There isn't a set amount in this. Every one of us is different. No situation is identical. There are similar categories, but no situation is identical. So what does proper grieving look like? This is important. And I'm going to touch on a few things here, but again, I strongly recommend the book. You can read it in an evening. I've read it three times now. Extremely helpful. First of all, grieving is not linear. That means it's, yeah, there, there are various stages of grief, but it's not a pre-programmed set. Right now, I'm going to be experiencing shock, and next tomorrow, I'm going to have anger, and then I'm going to have frustration, maybe a little bit of depression, then either acceptance, which is the good side, or bitterness, which is the bad side. It doesn't quite work like that. Acceptance is kind of the final stage but there are cycles and there are circular issues that go along with that, and you'll be going in and out of them. Stages repeat. And as long as the grieving process is done in a healthy fashion, they will gradually have less intensity. Even though you'll still see a scar 20 years later. But you won't be crippled and unable to function. The ultimate difference in this with regard to whether or not we have been griefing in a healthy manner is between the categories of denial and acceptance. Denial and acceptance of the loss. Can't believe this happened. This really didn't happen. That's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to heal if you keep thinking that. Yes, it did happen. God brought this about. I can hope in him. And by his grace, through the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the fellowship of the saints, we'll get through this. Acceptance. So there's both denial and acceptance of the loss itself. There's denial and acceptance of the need to grieve. When something like this, especially a terrible loss, one that is sudden and unexpected, there will very frequently... Sometimes just out of nowhere, the need to cry about it will happen. doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Women tend to cry more, but men cry about things too. There is an appropriate time to do so. You're like, why am I crying? And you can answer that question in one of two different ways. No, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to deal with it. This is stupid. Or, I guess I needed to grieve right now. And you can thank God for the memories and for the blessing that happened in the life of the one who is now gone. Denial, acceptance. You also need to accept the category of the new normal. I know that's been thrown around a lot with COVID stuff, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the reality that if when someone is gone, especially if that someone were very close to you and part of your life on a day-to-day -day basis, when that person is gone, there's a new normal. My mother has been learning this over the last couple of years. Her husband of 25 years, gone. You don't wake up next to him anymore. You don't pour his coffee anymore. You don't have the ability to pick up your phone and give him a call well, something amazing happens when you're out doing something, visiting friends at work, something at church, doesn't matter. You're going to think, I wanted to call him, but I can't do that because I'm not here. It takes a while because you had habits and part of your life formed around that person so very tightly. It takes adjustment. That's normal. And again, in those situations, you wanted to pick up the phone and call, but you can't. Or fill in the blank with whatever else may be crossing your mind. You could deny it. It's like, this is, this is stupid. What is wrong with me? Why can't I get over this? Or you could accept it. 
I said, you know, it really was a blessed life with him or her in this way. Thank you, God. And you'd be crying a little. Denial. Acceptance. One leads to healing. The other to more frustration. And if you continue in denial, the bottom of that barrel is bitterness and despair. It turns into isolation. Where you don't want to let anybody in. If you happen to be around people. Or withdraw and avoid people altogether. But remember what we talked about already from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Matthew chapter 5. In order to have a proper grieving process, what do you need? You need the people of God around you, talking to you, working through this, weeping with you. Mourn with those who mourn, Jesus said. And he wouldn't have had to command us if it were something that we did automatically, rightly, every time. Solitude can be a good thing sometimes. You're by yourself, you're praying to God, you're weeping and mourning in a certain way, and that's, that's okay. But if that's all you do, that's isolation, and that's going to lead you into the pits of despair and bitterness. You won't get over your grief that way. Or rather, I should say, you won't work through it properly that way. And then you'll be left with an open wound rather than a scar. But what is the opposite of despair? The opposite of despair is hope. Biblical hope. Talked about it already. Memorize those verses from 1 Thessalonians 4. You'll need them. We don't mourn. We don't grieve like the world, but as those who do not have hope. Why? Because we have hope. But it doesn't feel like it right now. You know, my feelings have been messed up plenty of times, and so have yours. The truth of God's word will carry us when our feelings don't line up with it. It's like, I don't feel like it, but Lord God, you said I have hope. I'm going to hope and trust in you in this right now. Preach to yourself a little. A bit of a warning on this, too. Despair is easier the closer we were to the person, the more the person was part of our life on a regular basis. It's also easier the more shock there is. Brother and sister are traveling back, they're both 16 years old. He's driving, she's in the passenger seat. Car accident, she's killed, and he's in the hospital for a week, wakes up, and his sister's gone. Did I mention that they were fraternal twins? Hypothetical situation, but you can see it happening. That's going to mess with him. Survivor's guilt, that too. Despair will be really easy because of the closeness of the relationship and the shock about it. The more you're dependent on a person, the easier it will be to fall into despair. We need to be honest with ourselves as we work through these things. Honest that we can't avoid the grief. Honest that there really is loss. Honest the fact that there's a new normal. Honest about the fact that we need help. There's no shame or sin in that at all. God made us in the church to be interdependent and things like this. He really did. And again, taking a quote from the book, White says, quote, while there is a place for a positive exhortation to move on with life, to take courage in the Lord and to experience his joy in service to others, there is also the recognition of the, of the importance of tears. There is nothing wrong with weeping. Nothing. And sometimes it's necessary. Oh, by the way, be ready for holidays. It will be different. You need to prepare yourself for that. This last Thanksgiving for our family was kind of odd. 
saw a picture from a couple of years prior to that, and there were several people in that picture who weren't there anymore. My grandmother, my stepfather, my grandmother's husband, my grandfather, her first husband, died when I was eight years old. And her husband also died in 2020, a few, years before, a few months before she did. So it was kind of odd. It was still a good time with family, but it was different and it always will be. No sense denying it. And then this is something else. A text, the last text I wanted to talk about is one that I, I take my family to every time we go to a funeral or a visitation to a funeral. Because they're not exactly pleasant things, are they? Benjamin and I went to a friend's funeral who died from COVID complications several months ago, who is about my age. We knew their family, we still know their family. You go to school with them. But she is now a widow, about my age, because her husband died. Packed out place for that funeral. And I told him something that I think I was go I'm going to make a habit of as well. I said, sing loudly the praises of God in the face of death, for Christ has won. There's that First Thessalonians 4 hope again, by the way. And there was a lot of weeping and there was a lot of powerful singing that day. But this verse I read or have read in the van on the way to any funeral or visitation that we go to anymore, and the number of those I suspect will continue to increase as I get more gray hair, will for you too. Ecclesiastes 7.2. Ecclesiastes 7.2. It says, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting or a house of mirth, some translations will say it. There's another half of it, I'm gonna pause there for a second, and you might think, Solomon, what? What do you mean? <laughs> I don't wanna go there. I'd much rather have the feasting with the shouts of joy and the excitement and the happiness that comes along with it, with friends and family gathered around me, good food, good wine, smiles all around. Solomon says, He says, not only is it good to go to the house of mourning, did you notice that? Compared to the house of feasting? He says, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. How could it be better? Why? He tells us. Because that is the end of every man. And the living takes it to heart. Solomon says, we're all going to end up six feet under someday. Every one of us. And we need to be thinking about it and being prepared for it. And trying to ignore that reality by putting it off with a grand multitude of feasting. Not that, not that feasting and celebration are bad things, they're good things. Saturday night was a delight, and I look forward to them. But we cannot ignore the fact that death is the end of every man. It really is. So we go to funeral visitations and funerals themselves, and we praise the God of life and death. And we're reminded, our lives in this world are not permanent. You wake up in the morning now, I do anyway, my, uh, my neck hurts, and my back hurts, and when I was 20, no problems. This was this goofy meme that I saw on the internet the other day, like, things that made my back hurt when I was 14. Falling off my bike, running said bike into a tree, slipping off a skateboard, smacking against the ground, Things that hurt my back now, tying my shoes, getting up out of bed. <laughs> Somewhat humorous, but the reality is our bodies they age and they change and eventually they will die. But we have hope in the one who holds the keys to life and death. Jesus the Christ, God over all forever praise. who went before us. Brandon said it somewhat jokingly earlier, talking about Jesus, but he's, he's not dead. No, he rose from the dead. He was resurrected, the firstborn from the dead, and we too will be like him because of God's grace toward us. 
That's why we grieve with hope. But we grieve. But when you grieve, look around you. You have one another. Don't be tempted to think you don't and then hold it in. Because you do. And the comfort God has given us is meant to be used to comfort one another. I want to take a little bit of time if someone has some questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Does anyone have a question? Alicia. It's on Kindle. Um, I think it's like, what, five bucks maybe? The one I have, I've had for several years. I haven't looked recently, but it's not expensive at all. On Amazon? Definitely yes. Pretty good. Understanding Death by Matt McCullough. All right. Remember death. Remember death by Matt McCullough. Okay. Remember Death by Matt McCullough. Save for the recording. That way we can make sure we have it on record. So, grieving our path back to peace, James White. Remember Death, Matt McCullough. And I shall not die but live. I'm not sure of the author is, but it's a banner to his book. And he wrote, uh, he wrote devotionals every single day after he got diagnosed with um, incurable brain cancer. Oh, wow. One more time with the title. I shall not uh, die but live. I shall not die but live. Written by the former president of Banner of Truth. Douglas Taylor. Douglas Taylor. All right. I shall not die but live by Douglas Taylor. So we have it in the recording anyway to go back and check later for anyone who will listen to this. Those three books, highly recommended. God's Way of Peace by Horatius Bonner. Excellent. A couple other things I just wanted to mention also, maybe some extra text to read when you are in a time of mourning. Those that I mentioned, uh, read Romans 8, especially verses 28 to 30. Read Job, the whole book, especially the first two chapters in the last six. Read the Psalms. Oh, the grief expressed in the Psalms and the great hope expressed in the Psalms right alongside it are made for times such as that. To include Psalm 116, 15, which says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his, holy, of his godly ones. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Wow. One last quote, and then we'll pray and close. From section 522 from James White's book, quote, Nothing can touch my life that has not been allowed to touch my life by passing through both the Son and the Father. Nothing, then, is going to happen to me by accident. Nothing that is outside of my loving Father's control. He who spoke the world into existence exercises the same power in keeping me safe in his love. Let's pray. Our Father God, this is a heavy subject, but it's an important one. Your word deals with it very clearly, in a very powerful way. It is something that all of us in here have already experienced to some degree, and that every one of us will experience again. There will come the time to grieve. My Lord God, when we do, I pray you help us to remember. Please don't let us forget everything 
that your word has said, that we've read tonight. That we do not grieve as those who do not have hope because we have hope in Christ. Real, sure, guaranteed promises on which we can stand. That you have given us great comfort and that we can use it and we ought to use it to comfort one another. Because we're supposed to mourn with those who mourn. And that even when one of us dies, it is in you, and it's a precious thing in your sight. There's a lot of mystery with that. I mean, that point us back to the reality again that yes, we have hope, and our God is doing good to us, even in times of great sorrow. For the judge of all the earth will do right. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.